Lafayette if they owned all the utilities. And probably had a lot of truth that that was a concern. But when we look at LUS, been around for 121 years, it's been very well run. And you look at the decisions of the last 10, 15 years, were outstanding as the price of generation started to change. Uh, in 19, excuse me, 2012, we generated all our own electricity between Bonaire, the Peking plants, and Rotomaker. In 2013, we joined MISO. MISO is tied into renewable energy, low-cost energy, and currently 60% of our power comes from MISO. 38% comes from Rotomaker. So Rotomaker is being frozen out, and the other 2% is our local generation. So 98% of our power comes from somewhere else. The big issue now is where do we go from here? And, and you can see the public interest, and thanks, Mayor Robido, for bringing this subject up to public attention, because it's something we really need to look at, because the world is changing. In 2016, 68% of the world's new electrical generation was renewable. In the U.S., 62% was renewable. And why is this happening? Because renewable energy price has gone way down. We can look to Texas and see how low it's gotten. I attended a Texas Energy Conference, conference in Dallas in October. Got to speak to the broker who set up the contract for the state of Texas prisons and DOTD offices, a 10-year contract for 2.6 cents straight power, no peak demand power. We stayed at a broker's ranch in East Texas with the Boy Scouts. He's an electrical broker. He sets up these contracts. And at his ranch, I asked, what kind of contract you have? He says, well, I'm paying four cents a KW and no nighttime charges from sundown to sunrise and no weekend charges. This is a 90 acre ranch, has a camp and garage and, and, and freezers and all that running, air conditioning, you name it. But his monthly bill is $20 or $25. The lowest price of electricity now is wind. Next to it is re renewable, the, the uh, gas, uh, combined cycle gas plants. And a combined cycle gas is where you have a turbine engine that runs a generator, and on the same shaft, you have a steam turbine. These things are super efficient, 55% efficient, low cost. To, and then next is solar. So our big question is, where do we go from here? Louisiana is in the 1930s in terms of energy. We have an opportunity with Lafayette to get into renewable, to build combined cycle plants here at the current places we have. Uh, those are inefficient, cheap to build, and would cost ultimately lower the dickens out of our rates if we pass those savings on to our customers. So the big issue is where we go from here. Maybe the best thing that we could do is set up a citizen's blue ribbon committee to thoroughly investigate this Definitely. and guide us through the, through the future. Right. So thank you. Thank you very much. All right, I believe we do have, we did have three speakers that signed in past the due time, but I do believe this is as the acting chairman, I'm gonna let them speak tonight because I do believe this is an important issue. So if, if you would call for the first speaker, please. Dr. Michael Walden. spoken public comment. Thank you again. I'm Dr. Michael Walden uh, in District 3. I apologize for signing in late. I wanted to make some comments relative to what we've heard tonight. Uh, first, I want to remind you that for years now, local citizens have been begging 
to have input on the IRP. The IRP is the integrated resource plan that all utilities, including LUS, put together to plan five or ten years out into the future. That's where they plan and decide what kind of power plants they need. The citizens, all of them that I've, most of them that I've talked to, really disagreed with the decision to do 20-year bonds to improve that coal plant in Alexandria. But the government at the time, not our current mayor president, and many of you weren't here, uh, they decided we would saddle the citizens with 20 years of bonds to upgrade the coal plant. Uh, many citizens didn't think that should happen. If we had had an open IRP process, an open planning process that allowed the, the real experts that we have in this community to come and talk about it, I think we could have improved the management that we've seen in the last few years. I also uh, object to the idea of buying a, a reciprocating gas generator. This is a technology that Edison would have understood. This is the way he was making electricity. A reciprocating gas engine is one of the least efficient ways to burn gas. Uh, I do think we need probably to, at some point, have, have some solution for our needs. Uh, one possibility that we need to be thinking about are batteries. Uh, batteries are coming down at a rate of 50% every five years. Not as fast as solar cells, but the cost of batteries is coming down really fast. And a battery backup storage would do just about exactly the same thing that a reciprocating engine does. And it has zero fuel costs because it takes in the electricity when you've got excess or when it's cheap to buy on the grid and then it gives it back when there's a high demand. That's the idea of the reciprocating engine, too, is that it can come on quickly and meet a high demand. Batteries are going to displace those reciprocating engine generators. They are going to displace reciprocating engines probably before we can get it built, and certainly before we ever pay off the bonds. They want 30-year uh, bonds, I believe, for the reciprocating engine plant, for a plant that's probably going to be obsolete in five. So we need public input. I beg you to have a public committee that works with a public integrated resource plan for LUS. That is something the citizens have been asking for for years. We hear nothing from LUS, LPUA, or the administration on a request to have a public committee. One of the things that we did when we started looking at this is we looked at about a dozen other cities that also own their operating plants. Virtually all of them have citizens committees, citizens panels that review the IRP and, and work in the IRP process. We are alone in having a totally undisclosed process for the planning where an engineering firm is hired, they do an IRP with no public input, and then the IRP is brought, and that's what we're told we need to follow. Other cities don't do that. Now, I know we've, we've been lucky in the past or, or had great management, but to go forward, we need public input, and we need to take advantage of the expertise that we have in this community on electrical on electrical generation. Thanks. Next speaker. Next speaker is Jeremiah Supple, and he will be followed by Derek Mesh. Uh, thank you for allowing us to speak. Um, just a, a few short points. Uh, one, um, the I want to call your attention again to the expenses that were discovered by Mr. Mike Lunsford, who discovered that the expenses that 
LUS Electric was charging to LUS Fiverr in the tune of 1.7 million was not discovered by our CPAs, not discovered by this board, not discovered by the Chamber of Commerce. It was discovered by Mike Lunsford, who is paid nothing. He's a, he's a, he is a, um, uh, a, a man that uh, uh, is, loves his town and spends a lot of his free time um, looking at things like this, and he discovered that. Now, I want to also say that by shifting 1.7 million in expenses from LUS to LUS Fiber, in my estimation, changes the value of LUS, but drops it by $20 million, 15 to $20 million, and shifts that value from LUS to LUS Fiber. Now, in addition to that, I'm also told that there are some in lieu of taxes that are owed by LUS Fiber that has not been paid, but has been paid by LUS. So that's yet to come out, which also will impact, will, will greatly impact the value. Now, Mr. Robodeau, uh, I think, did the right thing. He addressed this. And he addressed this in a, in a uh, and uh, and I, I support his decision, but th that's one thing. The magnitude of this, I think, is pretty big, and I'd like to call that to your attention. One other, th one other point. I don't know Mr. Bernhardt, uh, but I, I know him by reputation, and I know him also by an article that was written in 2005 uh, called the Blue Tarp. Scandal. I, I encourage you to read that article uh, in the Times Picayune in 2005. He he uh, charged. Uh, he got the contract to put the blue tarps on the houses in New Orleans, and he charged $175 a square to put blue tarps on a house. Now, a roof. A full roof costs less than that, and the subs. I knew. I knew uh, some of the subs. The subs were doing it for two dollars a square. So uh, he's he's probably a fine man, but I, he's known to be someone who is uh, who is uh, a hard nosed businessman. And I would suggest and he's got Goldman Sachs analysts that advise him, and I would suggest that we would get Goldman Sachs analysts to advise us if we're in that situation and negotiating with him. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Is this the last speaker? Final speaker, Derek Mesh. Oh, actually, Joel. I think uh, you're up. You'd like to say something? After Derek. Okay. Well, well, it's fresh in our minds. The comment was made about in lieu of taxes coming from LUS Fiber. That was addressed in recent months and making an adjustment where it's no longer in lieu of taxes. Can anyone provide some details as to how that came about and what's in place today? Ms. Toops, Jeff. Lord, you're on, Ms. Toops, your, your mic is hot. I believe that there was an ordinance passed regarding that, the details of which I believe Antonio or Teles would be better prepared to discuss. Antonio Connor, Customer Support Services Manager for LUS. Back in 2015, an ordinance was passed by the LUPUA and by the council uh, that effectively removed the uh, requirement for LUS fiber to make an ILA payment. Um, we came forward with an, an ordinance recently to adjust the timing of that schedule, uh, but that we deferred that indefinitely. And so, as of now, it's the actions that are taken pertaining to LUS fiber as an uh, ILA uh, are still governed by that 2015 ordinance. 
Okay, thank you. I just wanted that clarification before we went any further. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. All right. Final speaker. My name is Derek Mesh. I've worked for LUS Fiber for 13 years. And I have to say it's been a very exciting 13 years. I have a total of 30 years in the telecommunications industry. I've worked for Wiltel. I've contracted for MCI. I've worked for a local hospital here. And I can tell you one thing. I have never seen a more dedicated team and group than we have in our electrical linemen, our substation attendants, our fiber technicians, our fiber installers, our fiber engineers. And my question is, what's going to happen to the civil service uh, contract or status, really, of these employees? Because I can tell you right now, I'm 53 years old. I'm here for the retirement. I would like to make at least, you know, till I'm 60. We've had uh, one of our guys that recently retired, you know. Um, that's what we're all looking forward to. And if we have a sale of LUS Electrical, I want to know how we're going to keep all those linemen, what kind of benefit package we're going to have, are they going to still be civil servants, what's going to keep them from going to Entergy or Slimco, because you're going to have a brain drain out of here that I don't know if whoever buys it is going to be able to fill. Perhaps they can, perhaps they can't. I don't know. But I can tell you one thing. I worked 13 hours yesterday on call. We had a cable damage. Somebody came in after just coming in out of town to help me with that cable damage. Are we going to have that kind of dedication? We come in for storms. We come in for outages. We come in for a car crash. Somebody hits a pole. We had one of our cabinets that got completely wiped out by a car wreck, by a drunk driver. When we got it up and back up and running, AT&T and Cox were just showing up on the scene. I mean, we have a dedicated team in the linemen, the technicians, and everyone else I've met at LUS, from the janitor all the way up to the engineers. And I don't want to see that team disbanded or broken up or anything. And I would really appreciate it if the council would take this into consideration to keep us on. Maybe bring Bernhard on as a consultant or a contractor. Let them start out, get their feet wet or something. Y'all are the geniuses, I'm not. I've done the technical side for 30 years. I know a little bit about management, but not a whole bunch. But I can tell you, I know what telecommunication companies have failed and what has worked, and I'm worried. I can tell you the truth. I've seen companies succeed wildly, and I've seen companies go under. Like I said, I've been doing this for 30 years. And I know this is about the electrical side, but fiber is also tied into that because we have our right-of-ways on the poles. Who's going to maintain those right-of-ways? What lease options are we going to have for the utility poles for Cox, AT&T, and fiber that's also on those poles if we sell them out? What about the underground right-of-ways? Who's going to maintain that? Are they going to have tree trimming on the right-of-ways? Who's going to own the land for the substations? All these are still questions that that are out there. So I just want to say basically thank you. I hope I can keep working here. I hope all of us can keep working here. And I hope you take into consideration the dedication of the employees that you have working for you at the present time. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, that was the final speaker. All right, I believe Mayor Robito, you would like to say a few words? Yeah, very quickly. Um, uh, let me say following Mr. Mesh, LUS is LUS because of the employees, and I think we all know that, um, and that's not the, just the current employees, that's everybody that, that's worked there. Um, it, Terry Huval did an incredible job um, hiring incredible people uh, that are in place now to, to do the, uh, the work that needs to be done. Sid, if you could just put the timeline up for me, um, go ahead and, 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 and put that up. Um, I'm not sure if Mr. Scheffler's numbers are correct, but it is important to note that, that the LUS that a lot of us, when we think of it, myself included, until I, I actually got elected mayor, you didn't realize that we, we do only produce 2% uh, um, locally of our electricity, 30-something percent um, in Boyce out of the coal plant, and then the rest, the 60-something percent, is purchased off of the market. Considerably different than what happened in 1914, 1927, 1950 even. Um, it is a, a highly regulated and very complex industry. Um, and, and to the, the one gentleman that 
um, spoke about the timing is the reason I'm putting it up. Rest assured that I appreciated everything that Terry Huval has done for LUS. Um, he um, is forever going to be known, I think, in Lafayette as LUS, as having done an incredible job. Um, and it wasn't until after he told me of his intentions to retire that I agreed to let Bernhardt come in and, and do the evaluation and the assessment. That document wasn't signed uh, until April the 9th, long after. Now, the public announcement uh, did happen to come the day after, uh, but, but those conversations had been going on uh, since middle, uh, the middle of March after the, the Public Service Commission issue. So with that, I appreciate all the public's comments. Uh, I think they're extremely important both today and more important going forward. Uh, as we figure this out, uh, at the end of the day, we don't have the funding for the generation that we need. We need to figure out if we're going to approve a bond issue or not for that, or are we going to approve um, a bond issue or uh, the expenditure for us to go purchase the generation that we're going to need off of the market? Um, are we going to convert the coal plant to something that's more energy efficient? more um, in line with alternative energy, uh, but what decision are we going to make there? We need to consider that. Um, after I have the evaluation, it will be publicly shared, as was always the intent, um, but I need the evaluation to know where we are uh, internally. Um, once that is produced, then we can engage in a, a very robust conversation about what the next steps need to be. And my intention is that we're going to discuss everything. All options are on the table, and I don't have any idea where we're going to end up. I don't have a bias towards one solution or the other. I just know that I have a responsibility to look at every option available to present that to the LPUA and that together we're going to figure this thing out. The public will be engaged as they were tonight, uh, more so as we have more information. But this is the timeline of why I made the decision to have the Bernhard Group go in and provide me with the assessment. Um, and so nothing was done um, uh, intentionally as a secret, but Anytime you engage someone to go in, whether we're talking about the LUS fiber conversations that we had with Google uh, that went nowhere, um, whether it's other conversations that we have weekly, monthly, yearly that oftentimes go nowhere, this may ultimately go nowhere. But we're going to have the conversation because I'm tasked with making sure that whatever we do is in the best interest of the ratepayers of LUS and the taxpayers of the city of Lafayette. And so, rest assured, we will have a robust conversation. I look forward to that conversation. And I don't have a bias, even though emotionally I'm like m many of you, that LUS tugs at my heartstrings because it is such an incredible asset. Um, but we're still going to have the conversations, as difficult as it may be to figure out what's the, the best path forward. So thank you uh, for the opportunity to present this and thank everybody in the audience and whoever's tuning in because ultimately uh, this is going to be a public discussion. Thank you very much, Mayor Robito. We do appreciate your honesty and, and all the informa that you sh information you shared with us tonight. Um, I believe Mr. Bujo would like to say a few words. Actually, I have a question for the legal minds tonight. This issue, as it's been discussed, who would ultimately, if, if anything is being considered, what body of legislatures will make the decision to do something? Will it be the LPUA or would it be the full council, which of course has individuals who don't use LUS, who don't live in the city limits of Lafayette, who, who, who you know, basically are not, they're kind of like outsiders as well, I guess you could say. But I, my question is, if something was to come forward, would that be approved by this body, the five-member apps, and of course, uh, um, uh, Chairman Abair, or does individuals who live outside of the city limits and who don't use the, the, the system, 
will have a vote on that as well. I'm going to have to look at the current charter real quick. So if you want to go ahead and continue on with the meeting and I can come back in. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And, and it's, it's and just, you know, and for some clarification, sure. yeah, it, it's important because I've heard a lot tonight about privatization, outside influence, right. people who are not in control, who utilize. And I'm really curious to know who, who is going to control their decision in that direction. All right as far as that's concerned. So please continue on with the meeting and just allow Mr. Escott, once he gets that opinion, to come back. Thank you. All right, we will move on now to moving for ordinances for final adoption. Um, Jeremy, will you please read the first ordinance? Authority amending the fiscal year 1718 operating budget of the Lafayette City Parish Consolidated Government to adjust amounts for risk management uninsured loss reimbursements to actual. I have a motion from Mr. Conk and a second from Mr. Boudreau. Any LPUA discussion? Any public comment? Yes, no ma'am. Uh, let's call for the vote, please. District 4? Yes. District 6? Yes. District 7? Yes. District 3? Yes. Motion is approved. Ordinance 12, 2018, LPUA, an ordinance of the Lafayette Public Utilities Authority providing for the abandonment of a 10-foot utility servitude and right-of-way for future extension in Cypress Cove Phase 2 and the granting of a 35-foot drainage easement and a 10-foot utility easement on the property of Blaine A. Moreau and Frank J. Cormier. I have a motion from Mr. Boudreau and a second from Mr. Lewis. Any discussion? LPUA, no public comments? No, Let's call for the vote. District 6? Yes. District 7? Yes. District 3? Yes. District 4? Yes. Motion is approved. Right. Uh, director's update, uh, anything from, yeah, thank you, Mr. Stewart. <clears throat> thank you, Ms. Cook. Uh, my name is Jeff Stewart, Engineering and Power Supply Manager for LUS, and just want to take a moment uh, to address the LPUA and, and anyone listening. Uh, make a pledge. Make a pledge to the LPUA. Make a pledge to the council, the administration, but most importantly, our customers. That the transition, we're in a transition uh, period right now. There's a lot of discussion going on, but our, our employees, LUS and LUS Fiber employees, are here to do the job. We're here to show up. We're here to get the job done. We're here to serve our customers like we've done for many, many years. That won't change regardless of the discussion, regardless of, of what's being said. We're here to do our job because we love it. We love what we do for our customers, and we're going to be here until the bitter end doing it. Uh, so I just wanted to make that uh, pledge to our customers. And if there's any questions, you know, please, about LUS, come see me. LUS Fiber, Ms. Teles Freeman is in the front row. You know, we'll, we'll answer questions. We'll do what we've been doing for years and years. Uh, so I just wanted to, to reassure our customers of, of what we're doing. Thank you, Jeff and Teles. Thank you all both for stepping up. We appreciate it. Um, and any other business? Oh, they're still reviewing. Sorry. I know y'all are ready to go. <laughs> hmm. Anything else? All right, Councilman uh, Boudreau, the reason for the, the hesitation was because there are some circumstances within which in the charter there is um, a crossover in um, approvals related to LPUA and the Lafayette City Parish Consolidated Government Council. And so in answer to your question uh, regarding the sale or lease uh, of the, any portion of the utilities, it's in reading the charter, it's my opinion that it would require the approval of both the LPUA and the City Parish Council. And then ultimately, obviously, if a sale uh, or lease is proposed, it has to be voted on by the people under the charter. Right, right. So, in, in, in thank you for that, by the way. I, I saw some of the other legal minds of affiliated with I, I had with the LUA. whole crew. <laughs> yeah, you, you brought in everybody. But um, it, it's, it's significant. Um, Mr. Kunk alluded to something earlier as it relates to these matters and so many other issues that we're dealing with um, as it relates to our charter in general. And um, 
it, it's good to be able to address these issues. But at the end of the day, unless you fix the structure, these issues are going to remain in place. So what we have just learned is that uh, regardless of what the members of the council that represents the city of Lafayette, there will be, there will be outside influence on the ultimate direction and final destiny of LUS by people who do not use this system, by people who do not live within the city limits of Lafayette, and by individuals who are not impacted positive or positively or negatively either way. I suggest that you think about that as you leave this place and as we go forward into the future when you make considerations. What I've heard here tonight, all of which has been positive, is that the citizens of the city of Lafayette wants to be in control of whatever happens with the Lafayette utility system. I am sorry to tell you that that is not the case in our current form of government. You need to know and understand that, regardless of what you hear from anyone else. That is the reality. So to the legal team, I thanks for that clarification. And um, I think you have an announcement of how we're going to transition into our next meeting. Well, Ms. Cook. You're, looking oh, you're, talking you're the chairperson. <laughs> oh, yeah. Are we going to take a, about a five-minute break? Yeah. In between yes, ma'am. We have okay. to power down. We'll power down the system and get the full council in place. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. We are going to take a little break, so uh, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs> you look the He's like, you're talking to him. It's a joke.
question I have on that is, that's fine. Why did the LPUA have that for consideration also? Because it's probably a form of application that's already been done. Yeah, it's going to be a little nice. Okay. And it's also mobile. And all LPUA.
six, seven. Let me see which one he wants to amend. All right. This Let's one. Reboot. It's this Back one. Him. All right. Ask who for an amendment. There's an amendment being Just offered. Go, legal, yeah, go legal. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Look. A motion in second. Legal. Okay. Legal. Pass. All right, at this time we'd like to get the meeting underway. At this time I'd like to ask Councilwoman Annette Cook to lead us in a prayer and ask Councilman Conk to lead us in the pledge. Give us insight to lead with integrity that our decisions may reflect what is right and good. Keep us from short-sightedness and pettiness. Help us to make decisions that are for the good of all and guard us from blind self-interest. Dear Lord, grant us the humility to Always seek your will in all that we do and we, what we say. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. All right. Welcome to tonight's meeting. Hope everyone had a great day. Stayed out the heat. I'm back from a vacation, so uh, I want to thank Councilman Conk for leading this in the last meeting while I was out. Appreciate it. Uh, just a quick announcement before we get started. Uh, the fire department is asking that everyone have a seat. Uh, there are some open seats available. We're not going to have anyone be able to stand up in the back wall, so it looks like everybody's uh, following that. And uh, just for those that are watching or those that are in the council chambers we are starting late because the lpua's meeting went over and um, so now we're here to start our regular lcg uh, parish council meeting we welcome you to the city parish council meeting we as your representatives in the lafayette consolidated government welcome your involvement and encourage your participation this meeting is a public hearing if you wish to address the council on any item on this agenda please fill out the request form in the foyer the request to address the council blue form must be filled out and submitted prior to the call of the agenda item or you will not be given that opportunity to speak. If assistance is needed with submitting the request, the staff is available to help. In the event a speaker has completed their comments prior to the expiration of their allotted five minutes, then any remaining time shall be forfeited. And just to let everyone know that this evening the electronic uh, blue cards is not working, so we're re referring back to the original blue cards, so make sure that you uh, locate the blue cards. If you have any materials you wish to submit to the council, please give those to the council clerk, Ms. Veronica Williams, who's seated to my left and in the middle. In an effort to allow everyone opportunity to be heard, the five-minute rule will be in effect. Speakers shall refrain from debating personal attacks and from making confrontational or derogatory comments. I am requesting that the first row to my left be used for media only. Lastly, food and drinks are not allowed in the auditorium, and we ask that all cell phones, electronics, devices uh, be silenced from this point forward. I am also requesting that anyone who approaches the council, please state your name and title for the official record. That also applies for department directors. Meeting procedures are by resolution and not by Robert's rules of order. Documents, including agenda, ordinances, and resolutions, and the minutes related to the meeting here this evening, is posted online at www.lafayetteLA.gov, or you can refer to the web address on the top of the agenda. This council does encourage your involvement and participation by volunteering for boards and commissions. If you're interested in finding out which board suits your interests, we ask that you call 291-8800, or you can pick up a pamphlet at the door. Moving on to chair announcements. Directly following this meeting, there will be a meeting of the Lafayette Rural Fire District, then a special joint meeting of the Lafayette City Parish Council and the Lafayette Public Utilities Authority to introduce the fiscal year 2018-19 LCG budget. Then finally, a meeting of the Lafayette Public Power Authority to introduce the fiscal year 1819 LPPA budget. Please be advised that Lafayette City Parish Council may consider resolutions calling for a tax election at its meeting on September 4th, 2018 at 5.30 p.m. 
at 705 West University Avenue in Lafayette, Louisiana. Item number nine, ordinance number 108-2018 relative to the Lafayette Public Innovation Alliance. Legal has proposed an amendment to include the names of the trustees, appointees, and clarify the term conditions in the ordinance and Exhibit A. Item 13, ordinance number 112-2018 relative to the Buchanan Street parking garage. The mayor president has requested this item be deferred indefinitely to allow time for companion ordinance submittal. Lastly, um, Liz Abair, Councilwoman Liz Abair, District 8 is unable to attend tonight's meeting. And we'd like to wish Council Member Kenneth Boudreaux a happy birthday, which he will be celebrating on July 30th, and he will be He will have a new birthday. He'll be a new year. <laughs> All right. Happy birthday, Kenneth. Thank you. All right. Moving right along to council announcements. Anybody? Okay. I am not seeing any at this time. We're going to move to the executive mayor president's report. At this time, I'd like to recognize Mayor Robodeau. Your mic is on, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, at this time, I'm going to call up uh, uh, Dr. Sinead Nelson, the Director for Community Development, to give the presentation. Good evening. Um, I'm here tonight to give a briefing of the consolidated plan for HUD um, that we receive entitlement funds for Lafayette Parish for community development block grant and home investment partnership funds. So just to give you an overview of the application process and, and where we are. So the purpose of the grant is to benefit low to moderate income individuals. The application deadline for submission is August 15th. The program year is October 1st, 2018 through September 30th, 2019. Um, our public hearing process, we had public hearings on January 8th and April 16th, which were very well attended. We um, did a lot of outreach to get uh, public engagement involved in our public hearing process, so we're very happy about that. The grant awards, we received increases in CDBG awards and home um, in the amount of CDBG, our entitlement was $1,389,732 with an increase of $129,409, um, which is over the last year's program year, 2017. For home, the entitlement allocation was $613,000. $36,789 with an increase from last year of $189,921. We do have caps for our CDBG program. We have a 15% public service cap for our housing counseling program, which is in the amount of $208,450. Our housing counseling program provides financial literacy, first-time home buyers programs, also um, advocates for fair housing and tenant rights here in Lafayette. Uh, we do have a 20% administrative cap, which is in, in the amount of $277,946. And that is to, of course, administer um, the programs that are funded through CDBG and HOME. The program requirements for the HOME program, we have a 25% match. Um, that match has been carried forward from prior years. The, um, the funds for this program are restricted to only housing activities. Um, Achoto, which is a community housing development organization uh, designated here in Lafayette Parish, must receive 15% of each home grant award. We have $95,519 that have not yet been that has not yet been allocated to Achoto to meet that 15% uh, requirement. Uh, will require council action to allocate th these funds. Um, eligible activities for a CHOTO include rental housing or home buyer activities. Uh, and the board composition for a CHOTO must have a low to moderate income representation um, included on the board. The proposed budgets that uh, are being intro for tonight include uh, deletions for vacant housing division 
uh, positions. And the reason for this is that we like to have more funds, obviously, to uh, provide services to our constituents in Lafayette Parish. Uh, we have one housing rehab specialist program that was funded through CDBG, one carpenter one position that was funded through HOME, and one secretary one position funded through CDBG. Uh, these three positions are vacant currently um, and of course provides a savings for us um, to conserve our CDBG and home funds to go toward program cost. Uh, the personnel changes included, uh, we're transferring 25% uh, of a Carpenter One salary from the home budget to CDBG and downgraded uh, one secretary, one position from full-time to part-time, funded by CDBG. Uh, currently, we have implemented a new minor rehab program, which has been very successful. We're really working to uh, be able to serve more of the um, constituents here in Lafayette by providing minor rehab uh, activities, which include roof repair, replacement, handicap ramps. That program has been very successful, providing handicap ramps to those who are in need here in Lafayette, and also um, bathroom accessibility. So really giving us an opportunity to target uh, those here in Lafayette who have disabilities and are, are in need of those services. Uh, also, CDBG and home funds, as we know, must be spent quickly. Uh, we do work with sub-recipients here in Lafayette, um, a number of them that you're familiar with and uh, hope to, um, of course, work with new ones that we haven't worked with before who are interested in activities that can be funded by CDBG and home. Our current fund balances uh, for CDBG is $330,000 for home, $325,000. We're currently reviewing grant applications for project viability at this time to determine how those funds will be allocated. Um, and we will, of course, forward those recommendations on to you all um, and to Mayor President Robito within the next few months to review. And that is it for briefing. Just to give you a summary, there's a lot going on tonight, I know. Um, but of course, if you have any questions at all, please feel free to contact my office. You all received um, all the information about um, the budget, the, um, the process, the application. Um, you all have that via email. We're trying to conserve paper. So, uh, but of course, if you need a hard copy, just let us know. And that's all I have. Okay, thank you, uh, Councilman Boudreau. Thank you, Dr. Nelson. A couple of things. On the Choto, historically, I think there were only two in the area mm -hmm. uh, that had been applying. Mm -hmm. The balance or, or the 15% match that hasn't been achieved, is that because no one has applied? And if you need to get back with me on that, that's no. fine. <laughs> But that's not the case? That's not the case. Okay. That's not the case. So do, we do have eligible children that have applied. It just hadn't been awarded yet. That's right. That's right. Okay. One that we work with frequently is 7th District Pavilion, who right. does work here in Lafayette. So, um, right. Okay. All right. I just wanted to make sure that we didn't need to start reaching further to make sure we meet the, the mandates by the federal government. Sure. Also, I heard you said that we have re-implemented some rehab programming. Yes. Okay, because that had kind of gone away a little bit. For the minor rehab, yes, sir. So um, we have a major rehab program, which I think it historically is more popular than minor rehab, where we would um, provide a grant up to $30,000 to bring homes up to code. Uh, we also provide a loan to eligible applicants to cover the difference should home improvements uh, exceed the $30,000 threshold. With the minor rehab activities, we provide a larger menu, if you will, of, um, of program services that include roof repair and replacement, single system uh, rehab, handicap ramps and bathroom accessibility, and others that we're working through. They were sort of pilot piloting this right now since it is something new, but we just found that we would like to focus more of our attention on programs that are able to reach a larger um, population and um, extend our reach a bit. Right. Uh, because obviously with major rehab, it uh, takes a, a bit of our resources Right. Um, so th this is the thing, and it, and it seems to get lost each year on, on the rehab, minor or major, mm -hmm. is the lead paint mitigation. Mm -hmm. We we I, I have not received anything yet, so I'm going to just 
let this be a reminder. Mm -hmm. The type of homes that we're speaking of and the age of those homes are gonna immediately fall into that category. Historically, um, that immediately disqualified anyone from any type of rehab. Mm -hmm. um, I have seen in, in conferences that I have attended where other parts of the country that was not the case, it takes some mitigation. And I don't think we've gotten there yet. Mm -hmm. And, and that's a, a very large population of homes that would become eligible for both programs. Mm -hmm. So again, and, and um, one of the paint companies actually offered services in this um, area um, on the private side. So if we could just really get someone on that and, and okay. somehow just do the research so that we could mitigate the lead paint and then a number of these older structures that was, that's all that was used back then will be eligible. But so many are being disqualified and I think that's why the usage is a little low is because of that factor. So if we could just get that research thoroughly, let's find out what it's gonna take. Uh, DuPont, DuPont was the paint okay. company. They actually have a program that does lead paint mitigation with local government. So if we could research that, we could help a lot of people. Oh, absolutely, and you're, you're absolutely right. That is a barrier for a number of um, our applicants who would like to take advantage of our services. Um, but per HUD, of course, right. um, the threshold is, um, it's tough. It's yeah. tough, and a lot of, of those who can really take advantage of our services aren't able to because of it. And unfortunately, HUD seems to be moving that needle and moving that threshold to make it even more difficult. So I appreciate that and that we can certainly do more research to find more opportunities for mitigation so that we can serve those who are really in, in need. Right. So. so again, thank you. That's all I have. And, and great job by the department, as always, in serving uh, low-income and moderate-income individuals. Thank you so sure. much. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Kennedy. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Lewis. Yes, Dr. Nelson. Uh, as far as Mr. Boudreau was saying about the lead paint, but also about the flood zone. In the district, I represent this flood zone that, you know, a lot of my constituents cannot have their homes rehab. So I think you're aware of that. Yes. Uh, but also on another note is the, uh, about the major repairs you are talking about, $30,000. Mm -hmm. I think I heard you mention something about there's a program or something to help finance the remaining monies that he may owe, may owe to. So is that in-house yes. financing or do they have to go outside? Yes, see, that see? is, yeah, that is part of, um, of this program that is it is in-house to eligible applicants of course um, that have to meet you know be able to meet the financial obligation to pay uh, the money back you know because that would be considered program income obviously so um, that that is available to um, to our applicants who are eligible uh, but the thirty thousand dollar grant does not have to be paid back anything beyond that uh, would be in the form of a loan in the form of a loan so in some cases, uh, again, you're talking about in-house finances, mm -hmm. so it would be more or less a, a better rate than, than uh, the, you know, the consumer oh, going. Yes, at, at oh, ab bank. absolutely, yes, for sure. And I mean, you know, again, you know, considering the population that we serve, we do all that we can to, to assist, uh, but it's on a case-by-case -case basis. And again, you know, we have a responsibility to, um, to be, um, you know, the be smart with our resources, if you will. So just making sure that we want to assist applicants as much as we can, but within reason. So again, making sure that the applicant is able to meet that financial obligation, because the last thing we want is uh, to put someone in a situation where they're not able to meet that obligation. Okay, well, thank you. Mm -hmm. That's it? Okay, I'm not seeing any other uh, speakers. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, President, any comment? No, sir, Mr. Chairman, that's it. That's it? Okay. Yep. Thank you, Shane. Thank you very much. All right, we're going to move right along to comments from the public. This portion of our meeting is an opportunity to make your voice heard before the council, the administration, and the public. This is the time to speak about topics that are not included as agenda items. As I noted earlier, Request to make comments specific to an agenda item should be made prior to the call for that agenda item by completing the request to address the council blue card. Please, we request that all matters regarding specific city parish employees be directed to the administration and that it not be addressed at this public forum. We as a council have a concern for the privacy and protection of government employees. 
With that said, however, if your concern is not resolved in either an expeditious or satisfactory fashion, there are other avenues which can be per perceived, and we ask that you follow up with the council office. Also, confrontational statements and or threats will not be tolerated, and we ask that you conduct yourself in a civil manner and with the same courtesy that you would expect of others. There's a five-minute rule that's in play, and uh, how many speakers do we have? Ten, maybe eleven. And maybe, who's the if you maybe? count Andy twice. And, <laughs> and, where are you at, Andy? Where's he at? He left. He left? All right, so we're down to 10. Ah, <laughs> oh, okay, okay. All right, Andy. Our, Go ahead our, with our Go. first speaker is Dr. Michael Walden. And I have a question of Amy Robinson, if she could come by. Um, Amy Robinson. Thank you very much. I'm Mike Walden. I'm a retired hydrologist and environmental engineer, and I live in District 3. Um, I had three things I wanted to speak about tonight. Uh, very quickly, first I wanted to thank Terry Huval. Uh, he has been such an incredible source of information and knowledge. Uh, his, his breadth of knowledge is just incredible. Very often I disagreed with him on issues about <laughs> LUS, but uh, I think he always gave an honest opinion and, uh, and certainly was well informed. And uh, I hope to get a chance to drink a cup of coffee with him sometime if he's around and retired like me. Uh, second, uh, in terms, I wanted to speak about the ethics of government procurement again. Uh, in the things that the mayor president said at the LPUA board uh, council meeting earlier, I just want to stress again that when you work for government, you're not working for a private corporation. When you buy things, you can't just call somebody and say, hey, can you give me this? That is unethical in government. I don't know what the written ethics are here for our local city parish government, but I've worked in state and federal government, and if, if you advantage one bidder over another, you can lose your job, lose your retirement, and even go to jail. So uh, this is a serious thing. You can't just call somebody up and say, hey, give me a plan. You have to do it openly. You have to provide others who might want to do the same thing the opportunity to do it. Even if you're not paying them, if you're asking for something to be done, then you have to be open about it. That's just a basic government uh, type of ethics. And I don't know if you require ethics training of the council and the new members of the administration when they come in. But I know as a public employee, I was required to take ethics training. I was required to take procurement training. And I think if you don't do that, all members of the council and the lead members of the administration should be given procurement training. Now, uh, a third item, totally separate. I didn't know where to put this comment in, but I wanted to once again talk about the important need for weatherization in Lafayette, in the houses of many of the low and moderate income people. Weatherization can be extremely important to individuals. I've talked to a friend who I think is knowledgeable about this, and he says that while we have very low residential electric rates, if you look at the actual bills that people get, low income people in Lafayette don't get bills that are lower than most other places because weatherization in low-income houses has not been a priority and it's not been a thing that we do. If you have a low rate but your bill's just as high, to you that low rate is of no value. Uh, so in other places where they have commercial or co-op ener electrical energy companies, they are required to have weatherization programs. 
as a municipal program, we're not required to have one, and we don't, as far as I know. Now, weatherization not only can help your low income rate payers, it also really helps the system because houses that leak their, their leak heat into them and leak their heat out of them, at peak times, they are heavy loads on the system. We've been talking about needing a peaker plant. An alternative that, that really helps the citizens is weatherization so that you don't have that super peak demand when the sun's shining hottest in the sky. It, the weatherization program for LUS would help the citizens and the ratepayers, and it would also help LUS as it tries to meet needs and to not have huge capital requirements in the future. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next speaker is Benjamin A. Rhodes. Hi, uh, greetings to the mayor and board. Thanks for allowing us to speak. My name is ben Minister Benjamin Rhodes. I'm a part of an outreach organization called Highways and Hedges under the Ministry of Refuge Temple Ministries here in Lafayette, Louisiana. We are a worldwide outreach team, and what we do basically, we reach out to the, communi to the community throughout the world. Our goal is to reconcile all men and women back unto God. What our organization focuses on is bringing hope to people. We have many people in our organization, myself as being one of them, uh, that come from many different backgrounds, lifestyles, uh, poverty, crime ridden. I myself am one that come from a background of crime and imprisonment and all kind of things in life that were contrary to the organization that I'm now a part of. And I'm glad to be a part of this organization because once now that I have been converted, and changed over, I can relate to a lot of people that are still in the same conditions and lifestyle that I myself was once a part of and also led. Uh, I'm here on behalf of the organization because we, although we are worldwide, but we want to spread out more than what we are. We have approached many situations in different cities throughout Texas and Louisiana. You may have heard about killings and shootings of police officers here in Lafayette. Baton Rouge, Dallas, Texas, even in Houston, where we hit, we went to these cities and these states and pacified the city through our outreach endeavors. We go out, we set up tents and chairs, uh, portable sound systems, and we minister the word of God and hope to people and show them a light of change. We know a lot of times we have many advertisements and promotions that go out through different companies, whether it be a pharmaceutical company or whatever, to advertise what they're able to do and help and aid of what their, their product or service renders to people. If it's something that uh, people may have a sickness with, any kind of ailment, pharmaceutical companies promote what they offer to help and to aid. Likewise with Highways and Hedges Outreach Organization, we bring uh, advertisement and hope to people with the service that we provide, knowing that it promotes change, knowing that it, it is very effective. We've seen murderers come off the streets and become changed. We've seen prostitutes. We've seen those that have been strung out on various kinds of drugs or suicidal come out from those lifestyles and conditions and be completely converted, productive citizens in this society. Uh, and what we are looking for and what we're here for today is we come as a representation of our organization asking for support and help from our Lafayette Consolidated Government. You may say, how can we help? What we need as an organization in Highways and Hedges is doors open. We, we go out to the jails, we go out to nursing homes, we go out to various uh, communities here in Lafayette and surrounding areas. We're in New Iberia, we're in Opelousas, Crowley, Lafayette, Bro Bridge. We go to uh, the college campuses, but what we need is even a more open door. If we, if we are here asking for any support, whether it be monetarily wise, whether it be a, a connection to those that we may need to be in front of in order to get into other arenas, other areas, such as government housings, anywhere there, where there is crime, where there's a need for a change, 
One thing we focus on, we thank God for our police department, our sheriff's department. We have men in our ministry that are part of those departments. But something that Highways and Hedger focuses on is while police officers and, and those that are set 